Hallelujah. Today, let's turn together to Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah 55. And I want to um, continue something that Pastor began last Sunday night and flow in that uh, vein because this is a, um, a healthy faith-building message. Amen? To take the highway. We're going to talk about the highway here. Isaiah 55, 9, and uh, the Lord is speaking. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Hallelujah. As the heavens are higher than the earth, my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. He wasn't disqualifying us from his ways or from his thoughts. He was acknowledging the difference and the levels upon which each of them operate. The ways of God are a higher way of living. The thoughts of God are a higher way of thinking. And so he's not, he's not comparing it to leave us down in the low way or the low thought, but he is compelling us because in the previous verse, he said, let the wicked forsake his way. So he's offering us a higher way. He's offering us the higher thoughts. Now let's look at Isaiah 35 and verse 8. Isaiah 35 and verse 8. And a highway shall be there. A highway. He said, my ways are higher. A highway shall be there and a way. And it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those. The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereupon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. So this way, this higher way that God has, he identifies it as a way of holiness. And on this way of holiness, he said, even people who are, are unlearned, won't err if they'll stay on the highway. If they'll stay on the highway, even even if I'm unlearned, if I'm unskilled, if I'll just stay on the highway, I won't fall into the ditch, right? And then he says, it's a protected way that there's no, no devourer going to be able to reach you on the highway. No lion, no ravenous beast. It, they won't be found there. If you're on the highway, you're in a place that's already protected, and it says specifically, the redeemed walk there. This is our specific avenue to walk on. This is our way of walking. He said, and the ransomed of the Lord, that's us. Have you been ransomed? We were singing about that today. I've been purchased. I've been redeemed, I've been ransomed. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Sion with songs and everlasting joy upon their head. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So on this highway, there is a flow of joy and gladness that no one can take from us because we are walking on this higher way of walking, this way of holiness. Now, holiness is not something that a lot of people uh, think is, is important to uh, learn about because they put it into just a way of dress or a, a, a certain standard that different denominations have, have set up rules and regulations but we want to be people of the word. We are. And the word says the redeemed walk in this way. So we want to know more about this way. We want to let the word of God, not denominational regulations, but the word. We want the word to bring light to us so that we can walk in this way accurately and enjoy the benefits of this higher way of living that God has established for us. Now, I want to go back and just uh, 
remind us something that pastor said last Sunday night. He said uh, something that Brother Hagen had related. And Brother Hagen, he began pastoring um, at, the, at, at the end, I think, of World War II. It was in the 50s. He pastored for about 12 years, and then he ministered from that time all across the nation uh, until I think he passed away in 2013. Does that sound right to you? 20, 2003. I have the three right. Thank you. 2003. He moved to heaven. So from from the 1950s to 2003, he he ministered all across the United States of America. He made a remark several times. I've heard him say it, and I've read it in some of his writings. He said that during the 1950s, he noticed something about the body of Christ, the church in America. He said during the 1950s, it was not a common thing for the people in the church to have terminal illnesses. It was rare. Most of the people in the church did not have the terminal illnesses that he began to see later on in his years, in his traveling. He said he believed it was because people lived cleaner lives. And then he also said that he considered the way that the Holy Spirit moved in signs and wonders during the days of the healing revival, he attributed that moving of the Spirit of God to the cleaner lives that people lived. We know that the Word has outlined for us that this is the highway. This is a higher way of living, living in a way that is keeping my heart clean before the Lord. And again, we're not talking about regulations of a denominational teaching, but we are talking about how the Word of God helps us live in the light. Because there are even people in in denominations that they might keep all of the outward, outward expressions of what appears to be holy living, but they can have unforgiveness in their heart, and their heart's not clean before God with that unforgiveness in it. So we're talking about our heart. We're talking, it it will come out in our lifestyle. I live a different life than I lived before I came to Jesus. And it's because I'm living by the word, and in living by the word, it sets me apart. Because I'm being a doer of the word, I'm automatically set apart from some of the things that I used to do before the word came into my life. There are things that I think that that have, because of the word, ways that I think, perceptions that I have, attitudes that I maintain, because the word of God has set that as a boundary for me. It has set it as a standard for me. And I I wasn't necessarily trying to not do the other, but just by being a doer of the word, I set myself apart from the way that I acted before, from the way that I, I perceived things before. So this is what we're talking about. We're talking about uh, living by the word, by the spirit in a way that honors God and keeps our heart clean before him. Another thing that Pastor Steele mentioned to us last Sunday night was a story that our pastor has told us numerous times. And I remember when I first started traveling to go preach uh, on the television broadcast, and film the broadcast in in Little Rock, Arkansas. I would stop. I would stay over on. Uh, I would go over, go down on Wednesday and film on Thursday. So every Wednesday that I was there, I would go to church. And there would be numerous times I heard Pastor tell this story in the pulpit, Pastor Caldwell. And then there were other times that we had the privilege while we were traveling with them, maybe to have lunch with them or have dinner with them uh, while we were out on the road. Even I remember one time he told us this while we were waiting for the airplane in a hotel, in an a- airport lobby and if, during a layover. And he told this story. And so I began to recognize the Holy Spirit keeps having this story come while I'm here in the sanctuary or while I'm here in this conversation. And I remember specifically we were at a meeting that Pastor Caldwell was preaching at, and we were both there, and we had had dinner with them before 
uh, in the hotel restaurant uh, the night before the meeting, and he told the story again. So I'm going to tell you the story, okay? And he would tell the story and then just leave us with it. It wasn't like I'm waiting for the punchline. The Holy Spirit was the one who was bringing the punchline, right? So he would tell the story about when Oral Roberts wanted to start a ministerial fellowship. I believe it was called uh, ICFM, uh, International Christian Fellowship of, uh, Ministry, uh, fellowship of Ministers, and he or faith ministers. Uh, he, he gathered a group of leaders from all across the country to come to a meeting to explain to them that the Lord was telling him to start this ministerial fellowship. And in that meeting, Pastor Caldwell was there, and Lester Summerall was also there. And Lester Summerall made the statement that it would be a good thing if you could keep it clean. And then he looked at Frida Lindsay, who was the wife of Gordon Lindsay, who they started Christ for the Nations. But before that, Gordon Lindsay had been the one who had organized the ministerial fellowship of all of the men who were involved in the voice of healing, men and the women who were involved in the voice of healing. And that, is a, that was the title of his group, the voice of healing. But during the 1950s, the Holy Spirit was moving in the United States of America in supernatural ways and healings and signs and wonders it were uh, abundant and astounding and so uh this ministerial fellowship that gordon lindsay had gathered with all of these ministers who were experiencing i mean supernatural healings supernatural miracles i mean eyes where there had no been no eyes eyes formed in babies where there were no eyes before limbs growing out things that were were signs and wonders just beyond a normal healing ministry the, the group that they had gathered together would meet on a regular basis to pray. And, and as they prayed and they came together and they were in unity and they were seeking God and they were setting themselves apart for the moving of God, as long as that was happening, the, the ministry outreaches that they were doing were experiencing the power of God. But... Frida Lindsay said, when television came about, somehow we got a television put in the break room downstairs of the hall that we were meeting in. And then we would, they, the prayer times started getting shorter and shorter, and all the ministers would hurry up and pray and then go downstairs to watch the wrestling matches. Pastor Caldwell would go through that entire story and then leave you right there they would go downstairs to watch the wrestling matches the, the okay <laughs> the preachers would go downstairs to watch the wrestling matches well you know it was not long after that that there was less and less and less of the moving of the spirit happening in these meetings and in these in 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 the different outreaches that they were having that night after Pastor Caldwell told us that story, and again, we had heard that story numerous times and always just perked our ears up to say, okay, what is the Holy Spirit trying to emphasize to us through that story? I have it in my notes because when Pastor received this, of the, I, it, it meant so much to me, I copied it down. On November the 6th of 2015, the Lord said to our pastor, when I say don't get caught, this was after we had met with Pastor Caldwell today or that night, and then the next morning, Pastor Steele got up and he's studying and he's praying about that story. He's praying about Pastor Caldwell keeps telling us that story. And the Holy Spirit began to speak to him, and this is what he said. When I say don't get caught watching the wrestling match, I'm not referring to sin. What I am referring to is a slipping into a carnality which will cost the moving of the spirit. This is not necessarily sin, but it will desensitize to the point that the Holy Spirit can no longer move that individual 
or that body in the direction he desires as quickly or as powerfully as needed. I thought it was interesting that the Holy Spirit emphasized that person or that church family, that body, talking about a body of believers, that there is a lifestyle that all of us, as we live according to the word, it causes a liberty in the spirit when we come together. Do you realize that? I was listening and I shared with the praise team this morning, I was listening to Rick Renner this week. If you haven't gotten to hear Rick Renner's messages this week, I highly encourage you to go back. He's talking about the manifest presence of God. And in that teaching, he said there was a study done by Barna. And Barna is a research institute that studies things that happen in Christian churches all across the world. And they had done a study about the presence of God and they had asked people, and it wasn't your, your nominal only go to church on Christmas and Easter kind of people. It was people who attended church semi-regularly. Ask them, how many of you have ever experienced the manifest presence of God in a church service? And less than half could say they had ever experienced the manifest presence of God in their church service or ever. And my heart just, first of all, went out to people who have never known what happens when you get in the presence of God and how, how he helps bring things to light. He helps you understand areas that need to be changed in that presence of God when he manifests in our church services, how, how we are strengthened. Our spirits are strengthened, how we are, are liberated, things that we may have come in heavy, but we go out and, and without even understanding how it happened, we just say, I feel so much lighter. I've got so much joy. It was because of in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Amen. And so I was saddened, but at the same time, I was so thankful for our church family. I was so thankful that we have in our church family people who are hungry for the presence of God, who when we come together, we're open to him. We're, we're desiring to not just come in and have a service and check our box and say, I've been to church this week and I did my, my, de my duty to God. No, but we're coming together because we love him and we want his word. And we want his presence and we want his light to shine upon our path. And not everybody has that. I'm thankful for our pastor who has, has taught us how to respond at, when the Holy Spirit takes us out of our normal routine. You know, a lot of people, they're going to hang on to that routine if it means resisting the Spirit of God. But pastor will throw the routine out the window and say, the Lord is telling us to do this. The Lord is moving, and he's taught us. I know personally when I came, I, I would ask him when I first started, when we first were married, and I would say, how do you know to stop and to, to do that? How do you know to stop and, and to give a word or to stop and to speak in tongues or to stop and to pray for somebody? How do you know that? Because I had never been taught that. But I've learned in, in the, the, the training ground of these services where the Spirit of God is moving, that's how we learn. It's not something you can get out of a book necessarily. It's not something, I say necessarily because my friend Annette Caps has just written a book that will help you. It's not just the book part of it, but how the Holy Spirit has moved and, 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 and that that. that teaching that's in, imparted to us through people who have walked with God and moved with God and had his presence uh, and followed his presence, we, we need that. Amen? And so when he said that a, when a person, it's not necessarily sin, but when a person becomes in, in, infatuated with the carnal things or when it becomes more of an emphasis than spiritual things. Jesus said it this way. He called it the thorny ground. Do you? Because a lot of times when we talk about the thorny ground from Mark chapter 4, we're only emphasizing the cares of this world. 
because it was the first one and it is one of the most often experienced by believers to have to learn how to cast down imaginations and cast their burdens on the Lord and not be worried, right? But that's not the only thorn in the ground that choked out the word. He said there was a desire for other things. Lust is what it uses in the King James, but that is not talking just about a sexual lust. It can be a craving for other things, any kind of a craving or desire that takes a higher role or has a greater flow in our life than a desire for the things of God. Amen? He said it can choke out the word of God, desiring the other things more than we're desiring. So it's not a bad thing necessarily. It's not something that we would openly call sinful, X-rated, R-rated, vulgar. It, It may not be something that is openly, apparently sin, but it can be something that is gaining a a momentum in our lives that is distracting or detracting from the momentum of the word in our lives. We want to be on guard against it. And he said that it will desensitize. That's what the Holy Spirit was speaking to us. He said it will desensitize. And then the Holy Spirit said to our pastor, before the wrestling matches, they prayed for the power and the power always came. After the wrestling matches, they were content to live off a mere residue of what they once had, and the power waned. It weakened. The power of the Holy Spirit can only flow through any vessel to the point that the vessel open up and allows that flow. So remember, it says God is able to do it. Ephesians 3.20, right? God is able to do what? How much? Is he able to do en- enough? Is he able to do just, you know, just, just enough? Exceeding? Abundantly? Above? What we ask or think. But where's the limit? According to the power that works in us. So our vessel is, is allowing or limiting our vessel, uh, our, our willingness, our interest, our attention. He says, attend to my words. If people aren't attending to his words, they're not getting the light that comes from it. He said, attend. And he said in Mark 4, he said, the measure of thought and study you give to the truth you hear will determine the measure of revelation you get back. And I'm, that's the Amplified. But see, again, there, there we are, according to the power that works in us, according to the attention I give to the word, according to the measure of thought and study I give, according to my, my willingness for God to set me apart from some things. How many of you have ever heard of a Levitical priest in the Old Testament? You ever read through the Old Testament and they say the Levitical priest? When they were setting up the, the uh, tabernacle in the wilderness, there were those, there were those Levitical priests, those, they, were a, they were from the tribe of Levi. That's why they're called Levitical. The, but they were only allowed to do certain things in the outer court. But they didn't have a measure of sanctification that qualified them for the inner court. There was a different group of priests that could operate in the inner court. And the only difference in the main difference in the group was their level of sanctification, their level of being set apart. That's a type and a shadow. We're not under the old covenant, but there's, a, there's still a, a recognition that the more set apart I am for the things of God, the more willing I am to say, that might not be sin, but it's still flesh. It might not be sin, but it's still flesh. And I don't want to feed my flesh. You know what I found out about my flesh? If I feed it, it gains strength. If I give in to my flesh where my uh, uh, temper is concerned or where impatience, let me use that one, impatient. And I I practice that impatience. And I, I get impatient at the line at the coffee, 
drive through and I get impatient at the grocery store and impatient here and impatient. If I practice that impatience, then you know what? It's a quick trigger. It's like it, it gains a momentum in my life. That's in any area of our flesh, whether it be unforgiveness, criticism. Woo, honey, you better watch criticism. Blessed are those who do not stand in the seat of the, or sit in the seat of the scornful. Criticism, comparing. It, the Bible tells us it's not good for us to compare ourselves among each other. Say, well, you know, I, you did that, but I would never do that. You know, they're letting their kids do that, but I would never. You're not them, and their kids are not your kids, so don't compare yourself because then you put yourself in a position of a, that you're not qualified to execute judgment of what you would do in that situation. You're not in that situation. Amen. So do you see that is criticism is a major, major area of the flesh that will lead us to sin. If we practice it, if we yield to it, I remember, and I've used this example before, but it's a good example, and it taught me, the Lord taught me through it, that their pastor back in the day, he doesn't so much anymore, but back in the day, he liked to watch Sports Center, and he would, before, he liked the Sports Center because they just hit you, bam, 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 with all the headlines of who won this game and who won that game, and get to the point, man, you know, <laughs> Again, just tell me who won. I don't need to know all that other. You know, he, he's a headline kind of man. He's like, just give me the headlines. But before that, that show would come on, he would turn it on, be waiting for it, and there was this show called Around the Horn. And then in this show, I, we, we weren't really watching it. I would maybe be in there cooking or something like that. He would have it on waiting for the sports center to come on. He wasn't as much interested in it. But it's all these men criticizing all the games and all the players in the games. Y'all might watch that show. You might like that show. But just let me tell you what the Lord showed me through that show. <laughs> They would sit around, and I'm sitting there. I walked in the kitchen, out of the kitchen one day, into the living room, and I've got my dish towel drying my hands, and I'm looking at that man, and he has just tore apart this quarterback who played this play and, and just, you know, tore him up one side and down the other. And I looked, and I said, if that man ever did play football, it's been a long time. He hadn't played football in a long time, right? You can tell by looking. He has not been playing football, but he... <laughs> He is quick to criticize and run down this man who's given it his all on the field, right? And, and the whole idea of that criticism is so ingrained in our society. It's on talk radio. It's on the news. It's on all of these different social media. You've got to guard against the criticism. Uh, it, I saw a picture of Nellie. Y'all remember Nellie from Little House on the Prairie? And somebody had posted that, you know that face Nellie could make on Little House on the Prairie? Y'all don't know, Google it. But <laughs> Nellie, she was, she was always the sour, she was, had a sour attitude. She was always, you know, I'm better than everybody else. And she would make the face that just like, you know, I, that disgusts me. And it had that picture and it said, this is what other people are seeing as they're scrolling through your posts. And I thought, how true that is though. How many people are, are in that, they are being trained by the habit of that scrolling to scroll and judge and scroll and judge and scroll and judge. And they're just looking at all of these posts not to get encouragement, not to get edification, but to say, look what they're doing. And it can either be something they're comparing, I would never do that, or maybe I should do that, or whatever the case may be. We don't want to fall into the trap of the criticism because that gives our flesh a momentum that will lead us over into an area spiritually that will cause us to sin. So do you see that we want to recognize that for the Holy Spirit to flow through me, my decision to walk in the Word and keep my life right and keep my attitude right, regardless of what other people are doing. 
regardless of how other people are driving. Regardless of all of the, the, the different opportunities we all have to respond in our flesh, we, can, we are under obligation to the word to respond out of our spirit. Amen? Amen? Because we want to be vessels fit for the master's use. Then the Holy Spirit said this, carnality, and then he put in parentheses to this, how pastor wrote it out, wrestling matches, carnality limits the flow. Carnality limits the flow. It limits the sensitivity of the individual to the promptings and leadings of the Holy Spirit. What we are seeing in the church today is simply carnality. Too many are watching the wrestling matches instead of turning, tuning their spirit into what I'm saying. In the days of the voice of healing, I never stopped speaking, but many of them stopped hearing because carnality dulls the hearing. And then he showed him furniture that's been painted. And if you've ever gotten a piece of furniture and you realize this is not how it looked originally, someone has painted it, and then you start to take that layer of paint off and you find out it was painted before. It may be one color, but you start stripping that paint down and there's another color and then another color under it. Somebody's painted that piece of furniture a couple of times. And the Holy Spirit used that illustration to show him. He said, in order to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, any layers of carnality must be stripped away. Think of layers of paint on a nice wood table. In order to see the beauty of the table, the paint, must be stripped off layer by layer. This is why many in the voice of healing were very great and powerful in the beginning, and now no one remembers them. And you know that's true. Most people don't. It, there were people who in their meetings, those miracles, those signs, but nobody knows their name today. Because it's not, God was the one who did the miracles. God was the one who did the signs. They were vessels, but they did not maintain their vessel to be used of God and to have the longevity. That is the reason that Pastor and I connected ourselves to Pastor Caldwell in the beginning. Because we, we didn't want to be shooting stars. We had relationships before of people who were in ministry and then because of carnality fell. And we thought, Lord, we don't, we, we've seen it in the body of Christ. We don't want to have our ministry, the people in our ministry, our church family. We want to be people of longevity who are faithful to the call of God, faithful to the call of God, not trying to build a big name not trying to make it big in ministry, not trying to, because there, was, there is this idea of glory that's not glory. It's a, it's a fame, and it, it looks glamorous, but that's not glory. We want the glory of God to have his manifestation. We want him to get all the glory from our lives, and to do that, we've got to be vessels in line with his word Hallelujah. And so that's why we're learning about the highway today. Now, let me go back to our being born again. When you are born again, you are made holy. So what we're talking about in our choices, our lifestyle, our decisions is not what makes us holy, it's, but it, it's what holy people do. It's how, how holy people live. So go with me to the book of Ephesians. Let's look at chapter 4 and verse 24. Ephesians 4, I'll actually begin in verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation. Underline the word conversation, mark it. Many of you may have already marked it and you may have written out the definition for the word conversation because in the New Testament, 
It is not talking about verbal communication, although that's included. The New Testament definition of this word is lifestyle or behavior. Lifestyle or behavior. And he said that you, me, we put off. God doesn't do this for us. Angels don't come, don't come to help do this for us. The Holy Spirit doesn't do this for us. We put off concerning the former lifestyle, the former behavior of the old man, the previous before Christ you. The people we were before Christ, if we allowed the behavior that we were living before Christ, it would gladly take the reins of our life and, and play out the same thing we had before Christ. But we put off that behavior. We put off that lifestyle. We say, no, I don't live like that anymore. I don't talk like that anymore. I don't judge people like that anymore. I'm not critical like that anymore. I don't lose my temper like that anymore. I'm not impatient. I've got the fruit of the Spirit. I walk in love. I am long-suffering. Amen? I am kind. I have a soft answer that turns away wrath. I am not that mouthy woman anymore. I am not the brawling woman that it's better to live in the desert or on the rooftop in the rain, the hail, the sleet, and the snow than to be in the house with me. I'm not that woman anymore. Amen. Why? Because I put off that behavior. Glory to God. Put off the behavior, the lifestyle of the, style of the old man which is corrupt, notice it will corrupt. It is The lifestyle is a corrupting lifestyle. The lifestyle is a destructive lifestyle. The lifestyle of the flesh will destroy good things. The lifestyle, if a person lives by what the flesh is mandating or suggesting or tempting them to do, it, something's going to fall apart. To be carnally minded is death. It's going to cause death to the job. It's going to cause death to the relationship. It's going to cause something to decay. Put off. That's what, that, don't fight with it. Don't struggle with it. Oh, my flesh, my flesh. Yeah, my flesh keeps, no, no, no. I put that off. I don't, it didn't tell me to fight with it. Put it off. Why? Because it is corrupt. How is it corrupt? By its cravings. The deceitful cravings. The cravings lead to the corruption. The craving for four pieces of chocolate cake will never make you healthier. The craving for that is not making you healthier. Yeah, but I want it. I, I need I need pie after I eat. I got to have something sweet after I eat. The craving, it's not because your body says there is a nutrient in that pie, but it's cherry pie. Now, there's, it's still, all of the nutrients been, been boiled out of those cherries. There's so much sugar and butter in that pie. It's not going to benefit you, but you can crave it. And a person who yields to that craving and yields to that craving and says, you know what, one piece isn't enough. I need two pieces of pie. And then get a pie for yourself because this pie is my pie. <laughs> if, they're, if they're yielding and yielding and yielding and yielding, it's going to show up in areas that could be their arteries, they might need a new wardrobe. <laughs> it's not going to be a benefit of muscles. It's not going to be, look how healthy I am. Why? Because it's a craving that came from the flesh, and it's deceitful. It makes you think, I'm pleased with this because I'm tasting something that gives me pleasure, but it's deceitful because it's actually harming. Amen. And so people who say, well, you know, I just need a little drink to help me relax, that's deceitful. 
It's deceitful. The Bible, people say, well, you know, Jesus turned water into wine. You didn't, you don't see him drinking that wine. It didn't, there's no scripture that says he drank it. And the wine then isn't like wine today. Jesus wasn't a drunkard. And if you go to the scripture, there's nothing in scripture but warnings. It says, it says wine bites like a serpent. It says you got to watch out for the, the bite of it. It'll make you do stupid things. Proverbs. Things that you would not have normally done. So a person can try to, in their craving, well, you know, it won't hurt. It won't hurt. It won't help. Do you see that deceitful craving? Why, you know, the more I've walked with God, the less I've tried to see how much I could get away with and still be saved. I'm not interested. I'm not interested in seeing how close I can get to that thing without falling into it. Well, you know, I can still be saved, and Why even? You know, I, I, I hear Jim and Carrie Molson talk about that dog, Odie, that they used to have. It's passed away. But they, they had a dog, and that dog had been mistreated, and it had, been, it had lived a hard life before they, they, they adopted it, and it came to live with them. I think it may have been a stray or something, and they, they ended up with Odie. And the other dog, they would open the door and the other dog would bolt out of the house. Am I right? That other dog would bolt out of the house and say, "Woo, I'm ready to get out. But Odie would just stand right there by him like, I know what's out there. There's nothing out there I want. I know where I'm safe. I'm safe in the house. I got it good right here with them. I'm not in a hurry. I'm not trying to escape. I'm not trying to get away. I'm not trying to go out and, and, and sow my wild oats. I'm safe in the house. And when I hear that story, I think, that, that's me. Yeah. I know what it's like. I, that, my flesh nearly killed me. It wasn't just the devil, what the devil was trying to do with me. My flesh nearly destroyed, my flesh did destroy my life. I died twice and was brought back to life by CPR twice. One person didn't even know how to do the CPR, but they beat me in the chest with their fist until I started breathing again. Because my flesh was so out of control with the drug addiction that I was in. I don't, there's nothing about this world that even, I don't even want to see how close I can get to it. I'm staying away from that. Amen? So when we talk about this, we recognize that it is our responsibility to put off the behavior, the lifestyle that is corrupt with its deceitful cravings. And, and here's the key. Verse 23 is the key. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now, the first time I read that, I thought, does my mind have a spirit separate from my born-again spirit? Because it says in the spirit of your mind. But let me say it this way. Be renewed until your mind agrees with your spirit. Be renewed until your mind is, is spiritual. Until it's in line with the word. Be renewed. The New Living Translation says, Let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Be renewed because a person who thinks right lives right. If you think in line with the word, you're going to walk in line with the word. If you think thoughts of the light, you're going to walk in line with the light. The way that the enemy got Eve, and we can go back and we can use Eve as a model of how the enemy works. He brought thoughts and suggestions to her mind. He didn't make her eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil he didn't threaten her to eat the tree of the, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He suggested thoughts that she accepted and meditated on until it changed her mind. Because it says, when the woman saw 
that the tree was good for food. She'd never seen that the tree was good for food when she was walking in the light of the word. The word of God to her was, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because if you eat it, you shall surely die. In dying, you shall die. Don't eat the fruit. It wasn't good for food. It wasn't good for food. It was not good for food. But when she saw that it was good for food, what may, she saw something that was contrary to truth. The enemy brought a knowledge, wrong knowledge, dark knowledge, and exalted it above the knowledge of God. Here's the knowledge of God. The tree is not good for food. Don't eat it. Don't eat, there's death in that tree. So let's say that today I walked in and you could smell the brownies as I walk in with a plate of fresh baked brownies. You can smell, ooh, somebody's got chocolate in the house. Brown, I'm talking about pie brownies, all that, I'm sorry, forgive me. But you can smell the brownies and you can look at them and they look delicious. They look moist. You're looking at my plate of brownies and I say, I have brownies. I brought brownies for everybody today. They're, they're good for food. Now there is one half of a teaspoon of cow manure in the brownies but you won't taste it. The chocolate covers that up. You won't even taste it. <laughs> Smell them. Look at them. There is a knowledge that will direct your behavior. Knowing that there is half a teaspoon of cow manure is enough knowledge that no matter what it smells like, no matter how tantalizing it may appear to my eyes, I have enough knowledge, I'm not touching that. Amen. Do you see? She ate the brownies. There was death in those brownies. There was death in the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But she overrode what the knowledge was to go with what her senses told her. And the enemy uses the same tactic. As the Bible says, we are not ignorant of his tactics, his devices. He still operates the same way with suggestions. Well, it won't hurt you to do this. Well, God's not going to care if you do this. Can you believe how they talk to you? Are you going to let them answer you that way? You better go in there and give them a piece of your mind. They pulled out in front of you on the interstate. You need to, to throw up your hand. Pick a finger, right? No, that's not how we respond. Why? There's, there's danger in that response. Hallelujah. And so the renewing of the mind, taking the knowledge of God and giving it a place that directs my behavior. This is not a, a religious um, hardship or a regulation that becomes, oh, I can't go, I can't go. Here's, here's what some people would say. Well, I can't go see that movie because I, that movie, I can't go see it. What they're saying is I want to. I want to, but I can't go see it. Like, y'all need to feel sorry for me because I'm so saved, I can't go see that movie, but I wish I, was, I wish I could go. I wish I could go, but no, I can't go see. No, listen, I don't want to see that movie. If they're, going to, if they're going to use my God's name in vain, I'm not giving my godly money to it. I'm not going to give my godly ears to it. I'm not going to let their sin be sown in my heart. It's not that I can't. I don't want to. I don't want to. So do you see, if a person has that craving that I wish I could, 
there's the real problem. It's not about we're, we're, we go to church so we can't go to R-rated movies. How about I love God and he saved me and I'm not gonna dishonor him with anything in my life. I'm not going to let something in my life that dishonors him. I wouldn't let someone come in my house and, and dishonor my husband. What if someone walked in my house and said, you know, yeah, uh, your husband and, and, you know, he's this or he's that. I'm like, let me show you the door. You're not, no, 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 no. Right? How much more am I honoring to the one who purchased me with his blood? So it's the attitude. Hallelujah. We were created spiritually alive. Look at verse 24. Not only are we to put off the old, be renewed in the mind with the right knowledge, but then put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You are already holy. So what you do is just a product of the holiness that you are. I live this way because I am holy. God set me apart. I'm a blood-washed person, which sets me apart already. Do you see that? I'm created holy, and because I'm holy, I'm going to walk in line with that. I'm going to walk in line. So it's not the fact that I don't do a thing that makes me holy. I'm made holy in Christ Jesus, and I've got to put that person on every day. I've got to live out of who I am in Christ. That's why we have spent weeks and weeks and weeks talking about our place in Christ. When you know who you are in Christ, you will live easily out of that person that you are in him. In him, I live. In him, I move. In him, I have my being. So if I see myself in Christ, if I live out of that, that born-again new creature in Christ, I'm going to access all of the equipment that's in that place in Christ. I'm going to live out of all the power that's in that place in Christ. The Apostle Paul said it this way in Galatians chapter 2. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet the life that I live is a different life than I lived before. The life that I live in Christ I, I, I'm living by faith in Christ. I'm living his life in me. It's not my power that's trying to keep myself from doing wrong things or things that would, would feed my flesh. It's the power of Christ in me that's helping me say, I don't need to fall down to that low way of living. I'm on the highway. I'm going to take the highway. I'm going to live on the highway. And on the highway, there's automatic protection. On the highway, there's automatic joy. It's not a deceitful lust that gives me pleasure in sin for a season, but it's an everlasting joy on my head. It's an everlasting joy that I get up and I have access to the joy of the Lord, which is my strength every day. I never have to have a down day. I'm not in and out, up and down. I'm not here and there. I'm not experiencing uh, blue, blue Mondays or hump Wednesdays or freaky Fridays because every day is a faith day. Every day I'm a righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Every day the joy of the Lord is my strength. Every day is a day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Why? Because I'm living a highway. The most miserable time in my Christian life was when I was carnal because I was too saved to enjoy sin anymore. <laughs> but I was not living the life of the word because I was carnal. It was miserable. We, Pastor and I talk about our marriage when we first got married. And people say, what's the difference between your marriage then and your marriage today? We grew up. We were, we were both adults, but we were both spiritually immature. 
Even with the call of God on his life, even with the anointing, we had areas of the flesh that dominated our conversations that ended up in being very heated conversations, <laughs> arguments. Why? Because we were both fleshly. And what happened was we started walking in love. Instead of him yielding to anger, he, he said the, the scripture that the Lord gave him was a, a man who cannot control his spirit where anger is concerned is like a, a, a city without walls. There's no protection for your life. And so every time he would want to get angry, and y'all, y'all have heard us tell the story of I would go lock myself in the bathroom because I thought we were going to fight, you know. I thought he's going to hit me uh, and because that's what I came out of before Christ. And so he's, he's on his knees putting his face down to the crack in the bottom of the door, shouting at me to come out from under that, come out, come out of that bathroom. Like, I'm going to hear him better if he's down there shouting through the bottom of the door. And I'm like, I'm not coming out of there till you calm down. <laughs> and then I was just as bad. I would get mad at him, and I wouldn't talk to him for days. I'd be like, yes, okay, whatever. I was just cold. It was the ice age. We called it the ice age. It was carnal. But you know what happened? Both of us started walking in love. Amen. Both of us started applying. I started applying. Uh, uh, a soft answer turns away wrath. Proverbs 31. I started applying it to my life. 1 Corinthians 13. Save my marriage. But if we had not grown up in the word, we would have still been fighting the same battles with our flesh because of the carnality. Christians love Jesus on our way to heaven, but, but living miserable because carnality, you're too saved to enjoy sin, but you haven't started walking in the word enough to enjoy the highway. That's not us. We're people of the word. Amen? So 1 Corinthians 9, We're, we are the... Righteousness of God, we are holy. We are created in righteousness and true holiness. 1 Corinthians 9, again, gives us our responsibility. It says, but I, verse 27, I keep under my body. I keep under my body. So my body is not me. The I is the born-again spirit of man, the new creature created in righteousness and true holiness. Put on the new man. The I is the new man. I keep under my body. So my body has to be kept under. And he says this, I bring it into subjection. I bring it under. I keep it under. I bring it into subjection. What is subjection? Subjection means you're going to obey me. I've got a puppy. I'm teaching her who's boss. Right? You're not boss. You don't get to pull me down the street. Your body doesn't get to dictate the direction of your life. You bring it under subjection. You bring it under subjection. He said, I, the spirit, of uh, the born again me, I keep under. I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. This is the apostle Paul, <laughs> who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, telling us that every one of us, have to keep our flesh under subjection to the word of God. No one is exempt from this. No one is, is at a place where they, they can say, you know what, it doesn't matter what my flesh does. No, we all have the responsibility to keep our body under subjection. Look at Romans chapter 7, and we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. Romans 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, 
even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We are not debtors to our flesh. We serve God in the newness or the born again new spirit that we are created in Christ Jesus. We live out of that life that is in us because we accepted Jesus as Lord. Before I accepted Jesus as Lord, I didn't have any help on the inside of me. But when I accepted Jesus as Lord, his life is now in my heart. And I can, I can choose to live out of that. Let me give you an example. The Bible says that the love of God has been poured out in your heart. The Weiss translation says that it is uh, constantly being poured out in your heart. So you always have access to the love of God as a believer. That means you are never in a position, in a situation where you said, well, I just could not forgive that person. No, I always have access to the love of God. I have to choose to yield to it. I have to choose to yield to that love. That's my decision. God's not going to make me forgive. God, not, God is not going to make me walk in love to that person. I have to choose it, but he's always making it available to me. Do you see that? The same is true about any other area. The life of God is in me. I have to choose to yield to it. I have to choose to say, am I going to walk in, in the spiritual supply that is in me because Christ is in me, or am I going to walk out of what my flesh wants to do in this moment? Because my flesh would like to give them a piece of my mind, or my flesh would like to do this, or whatever the case may be. But I have to choose. God's not going to make that choice for me. And that's what we see here in Romans chapter 7. Look at verse... 22, oh my goodness, it would, it would benefit us to read verse 15 and 16 first. For that which I do, I allow not. Does that sound like a predicament? The thing that I'm doing, I did not want to do that. I don't allow that, but I did it anyway. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, that's what I'm doing. Can I see that in the Amplified, verse 15 in the Amplified? For I do not understand my own actions. I'm baffled, bewildered. I do not practice or accomplish what I want, I wish, but I do the very thing I hate, which my moral instinct condemns. Anybody ever done that? Why did I eat another piece of the pie? It's too late then, I did it. Why did I answer them? Why didn't I just bite my tongue and walk away? Why did I have to say that? Why did I honk my horn at them? The thing I'm doing is the thing I don't want to do. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. There is nothing good in the flesh. The good in you is in your spirit. And your spirit is always going to respond to the word. If you are knowingly responding Different than the word says, to, it, you, are, you are violating the word. If you knowingly respond, if you know that the Bible says 
to give a soft answer or to forgive anybody who's done anything to you, but you say, I know the Bible says that, but I won't forgive them, then that's violating the word. And, and that's where the light can't move any further in that area in your life until you, do, until you respond to the light of the word where that's concerned. Hallelujah. Verse 22, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. How do I get out of that carnal yielding to the flesh? Through Jesus Christ. I've got to look to him. I've got to ask for his help. I've got to yield to his life in me. This is not your, just your willpower. You have to submit your will to the will of God, yes. But it's not willpower alone that, that we do this by. It is by the life of God in me. That makes it so much easier. It's not a fight that I'm fighting with my flesh. My flesh is crucified. I keep it crucified. I keep it where Jesus put it. Under subjection. So the, the, uh, the original victory began with Jesus. It's got to continue with Jesus. The victory over my flesh started with Jesus, and it won't be maintained any other way. My relationship with him strengthens me to walk in the spirit. The cl- the, he said... You be united to me. Abide in me and I in you. That's the connection. We abide in him. His life in us gives us the victory over the temptations, the cravings, the designs of the flesh so that we can live according to his word. It's not not by our normal human strength it's by the spiritual strength he provides in his life hallelujah through jesus christ our lord that's how we're delivered from it that's how we walk in victory over the flesh we put off the old put on the new man in christ put on the new you in christ hallelujah hallelujah father thank you for strengthening us Thank you for revealing to us the victory we have in Christ. That that victory is so far reaching in our lives that it gives us even victory over our flesh. That we don't owe our flesh a bad day, a depression, a fit. We don't, we don't have to yield to our flesh in any way. Father, teach us how to walk in the light of your spirit. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Just lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord. I receive your help today. I receive your strength today. Father, your light, the light of your word, is the light I want in my life. I want to understand your ways, including this highway of holiness. Lord, let it be something that is real to me, not religious, but spiritually alive, that I see myself as holy in your sight, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I think sometimes because the correct application of the blood has not been made, that the residue of the shame of things we've done in our past maintains in the mind an image that I'm not worthy or an image that I'm not holy. Let me use that specifically. You're not holy because of anything you've done. 
you're holy because of everything he's done. So the holiness, you've got to look to him to see yourself holy. He said you were created in holiness. Talking about the new birth. When you were born again, you became holy. If you've done unholy things since that time, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you. If you'll repent and say, Lord, I shouldn't have acted that way. I shouldn't have watched that. I shouldn't have let my eyes see what I saw. I should not have had that attitude against that person in my heart. I repent for it. Whatever it may be, if you'll repent for it, the blood cleanses you. And now it, he says, if you walk in the light as he is in the light, he, the word cleanses us. Amen? And so that cleansing is an ongoing cleansing in our life. Whenever we need that cleansing, he's available to cleanse, to help us walk in that holy lifestyle, that highway. We're going to receive the Lord's shed blood and broken body in communion today. I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll begin to distribute that. In this, I want you to make a conscious acknowledgement that you're holy. Because for you to walk holy, you got to see yourself holy. If you don't see that you are holy now in Christ, it'll, be, it'll make it difficult for you to walk that way. Hallelujah. The purpose of communion is remembering. And it's a remembering that has a spiritual significance. It's not just a remembering for a, a reason to be sad. We're not sad about the victory we have because of this broken body or this shed blood. We're not to be sad at what happened to Jesus. That's not his motive for going to the cross. That's not his motive for receiving the stripes on his back. His, his motive was that we would be whole, that we would be cleansed, that we would be in covenant with God through his blood. This is the blood of the covenant. I have a covenant. This is the blood of the covenant. Through this blood, I'm in covenant with God. For me to honor the blood is for me to receive everything that the blood does for me. That's what really honors the blood. If I say, yeah, I honor the blood, but I'm not righteous, or I'm not holy, then that's not honoring. That's giving lip service to say, I honor the blood, but it didn't make me holy. <laughs> According to God, it did. We are justified through this blood. Nothing else could make us holy. Only the blood could make us holy. So for us to accurately honor the blood, we need to agree with everything it says we are. That's really honoring. You said I'm righteous. You said I'm holy by this blood. So I agree with that. I accept it and I'm going to walk in the light of that. You said that this is your body broken for me to be made whole. This is my wholeness. Through this, I'm whole in my body. Through this, I'm whole in my relationships. Through this, there are no broken places in my life. The power in your brokenness will make my life whole will restore my life completely. That's what the word salvation means, is restoration. This is my restoration. That's what I'm receiving today. I'm not receiving a cracker. I'm receiving restoration. I'm receiving wholeness. I'm not receiving juice. I'm receiving covenant. Every benefit, every privilege, every right, everything that is mine by covenant, including my holiness, my righteousness, I'm receiving it with my faith as I receive this. 1 Corinthians 11, we'll put it on the screen 
so that you can hold on to what you've got in your hands. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul said, I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Father, we approach the broken body of our Lord Jesus with an anticipation of the wholeness that you have provided in this supply. Lord, we are restored to wholeness in every area of our life. Your power is at work to make our lives complete. No matter what sin has done to us, no matter what our wrong choices may have opened the door to, we come today to your wholeness and we accept and receive the power of your restoration to work in our lives and restore. In Jesus' name, say this with me. I receive the restoration, the wholeness that Jesus' broken body has purchased for me. In Jesus' name, I receive. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Whole, complete, restored. Thank you, Lord. Every relationship made whole. Every bone, every joint, every ligament, every, every, every aspect of my blood made whole, complete. Thank you, Lord. Every organ in my body restored. Re restoration in my mind, in my brain. Restoration in every area. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we approach the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we come with our faith, agreeing that we are all that your blood has made us to be. Our relationship with God is all that this blood has prepared and provided in the New Testament. We are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus, we are the children of God, and we receive the benefits of the covenant with great thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You're so good to us. You're so good to us. Thank you for our covenant. Thank you for our covenant. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for our place in the family. Thank you, Lord, for our place in the family. Thank you, Lord, for eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We as believers have received and celebrated the provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I do want to give an opportunity, if you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, everything that we've been discussing and receiving on this morning is a result of the relationship that we have with him. And to enter into that salvation is by choice. We have to choose to accept Jesus as our Lord. When we accept him as our Lord, we receive every benefit of his lordship, which includes being born again, the new life in Christ, old things being passed away and all things created new. It includes that liberty that we're no longer debtors to sin or to our flesh, to live after our flesh. It includes our living forever connected with God. 
But it is a decision. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as Lord, I do want to give the opportunity. If you would lift your hand and say, Michelle, I don't know Jesus. I don't have a relationship with him, but today I want to make him my Savior and Lord. I want to give you that opportunity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, I want to pray for the sake of those who watch us through live stream because I, I feel that there may be somebody watching us who does not have a relationship with the Lord. So if you'll allow me to pray this prayer with them, just say this with me from your heart. I believe God has raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus died the death on the cross for me today. I accept Jesus as my Lord, as my Savior. Come into my heart. Wash me in your blood. Make me that new creature in you. Fill me with your spirit that I can walk in your plan for my life. In Jesus' name. The Bible says that when we believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead and we declare or confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, we are saved. Amen. Hallelujah. That decision of the heart is a spiritual decision and it changes our lives for eternity. Amen. Amen. I'm so thankful for the Lord. Did you receive today? Amen. I know you did. Thank you for your attention. Please stand with me to your feet. Join us. Praise the Lord. We do need to give the announcements. So can you sit down for just one second? We don't want you to miss what's going to happen at Faith Builders. Would you play our announcements for us? I'll stay right here so we won't tarry any longer than we have to. Mark your calendars as well. He's probably already turning things off back there. I apologize. We don't want you to miss. We've got some important things coming up in May and June, and, and we definitely want you to prepare your calendar uh, for these events. And despite that, we worked hard on the video to make the video, so we've got to at least play it, you know? Hallelujah. It's because I put pressure on you last minute. You're doing a great job back there, Brother yes. Dave. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Do you want to come give our announcements for us? <laughs> we have coming up in May. Go ahead and mark your calendars here. Uh, we have Dr. Jerry Savell will be with us Thursday the 19th. It is a Thursday, so we normally, we will have our normal normal service on the 18th, but then on the 19th, we have a, this special service with Dr. Jerry Savell at 7. Uh, and so uh, come uh, at early, get a seat. We have also, uh, we're, we've invited our church family from Faith Builders Raytown so we're hoping that a lot of them are able to come over, as well as Pastor Hernandez's church in Olathe. Uh, we've invited them to come out as well. So we're expecting the flow of the Spirit and the Word of God uh, in this meeting. And then coming up in June, we've got Sister Pat Harrison with us. Is she in June or July? June the 19th at both services that is a sunday and so she will be here for both services 10 a.m and 6 p.m and she always brings a a, a great uh, insight into the word and and the flowing with the spirit of god and so definitely mark your cal calendars am i missing anything else men's meeting june the 17th it, you can sign up uh, for that. I think Pastor's doing something special for you on a Zoom uh, meeting so that we can have everybody together from both campuses. And so sign up for that in the front as you enter in. Praise God. Thank you. We'll play the announcements tonight. We'll be ready for it tonight. Stand with me to your feet. Thank you for your patience today. Let's declare the vision of our church. The vision of our church will always be 
to build people's faith and frame their world by the word of God, you and I will always be world changers. God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this message. We would love to hear from you. If you have a prayer request or want to share how this message has helped you, send us an email at main at buildfaith.net. This message and many more materials are available to you free of charge, can be found at buildfaith.net or at any of our location media stores. As always, keep the switch of faith turned on and build your faith and frame your world by the Word of God.